This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. I, I want to start by thanking Burke Later uh, to give me the chance to present um, some personal observations about this sabbatical. Uh, and to Dr. Pizzo, Phil Pizzo, who is here, who uh, approved my sabbatical, and Harvey Cohn, who I don't know if he's here or not, but uh, Harvey was a part of this as, as chair, uh, giving me the okay to go. Um, why Africa? Well, you know, one of my mentors, June Brady, um, that Bill had mentioned, um, Children's Hospital of San Francisco. She was the chief of neonatology at Children's Hospital of San Francisco and a member of the Cardiovascular Research Institute uh, staff at, at uh, UC. Um, she has spent uh, 11 years in Africa, um, and most of this actually in her, in her later career uh, with her husband, George, George Hyde, who was a pediatric surgeon. Um, June was an inspiration because she always took the approach of an educator, and you could always find her with uh, students um, at uh, various academic meetings across the country. She would bring them with her, get them set up with projects, and do wonderful things with them. Um, Another person is uh, Daniel, Daniel Caridi, who is a Catholic priest from Kenya. Um, I met him at Santa Clara University about 10 years ago. And Daniel uh, just uh, said to me, you need to come to my country and see if you can help. And I, I sort of just tucked that away, and, and 10 years later, uh, there I am in, in Africa and spending some, a good deal of time with him. He, um, he directs an ambitious program, which includes a, a parish, an orphanage, uh, two high schools, one co-educational, a new one that we opened while we were there, a uh, new girls program. And he does collaborative work with the Assumption Sisters who, who basically are doing outreach um, in the communities around Naivasha. And so we spend a fair amount of time, um, two weeks actually, seeing some 300 patients in that milieu. You can't go there as a pediatrician. Uh, you come as a doctor or else. And a doctor means you see birth to all the way, all the way out, so ever uh, so whoever who comes in uh, would, would be seen. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, my wife, Marcy, um, because um, she played a large role in using all of our resources, our friends, our colleagues uh, from abroad, uh, the internet, uh, in putting this, uh, putting this whole uh, project together. Um, this was a, um, a, pro a project that was, uh, we were not uh, part of a tour group, a delegation, uh, uh, anything of the sort. It was basically uh, from the grassroots up, uh, which is the way we like to do things. We like to get uh, within the village, within the community as much as we can, and so this uh, follows what we've done in the past. Uh, we did the same thing in India. These two areas are related. Um, India and Africa ha have some common problems, and if you think hard on it, uh, we have some of the same problems too, except that uh, we have so much more excitement and uh, we can really look away from some of these, these same problems, particularly related to poverty. Um, Next, I, I think I have to say something about this peripatetic business. Uh, as uh, Aristotle was roaming around the Lyceum uh, teaching, uh, he, he used this term, introduced this term, and basically for an academic, I was traveling from place to place to learn from them, to teach when I, I could, and to really um, get immersed in what the local problems were, and that's where the peripatetic comes from. Um, the purpose of the talk is to give a personal view with some vignettes. Um, I put together some collage kinds of pictures that if you can gaze at them long enough, you can see a story in them, but we've only got 45 minutes or whatever, so that probably won't happen to a great extent. Um, I think one of the things that you learn uh, from the outset is that um, although our colleagues abroad and also in Africa are bright and interested and educated, in their case, uh, the creme de creme go to Australia, they go to England, uh, they go to great places to be trained. Uh, they're intellectually very, very um, excited. Um, and at the same time, they've got a lot of practical problems. So um, they like to talk to me and others like me about um, computer uh, ventilators, uh, nitric oxide, um, uh, various approaches that we used in our high-tech high uh, world. Uh, but, in, but in fact, uh, they, they have some grassroots problems, which I'll, I'll get into uh, as I go into the, go into the talk, which are, are really the key issue. Uh, to put it in perspective, a, a country like Kenya has 200 pediatricians, and I'll give you more of the demographics in a minute to put that into perspective. The data that I have to present 
uh, is actually primarily from UNESCO. And um, I will give you a, a website for you to look at. So if you want to read a 60, 80, 90 page document, which they update, uh, you can get uh, a lot of information. Um, it's one of those things where you read a lot before you go. I had friends giving me things to read. You go there, you experience it, and then you try to figure what, what happened. And then you read some more, and I'm still in that phase of trying to put things together, both for India and for, uh, and for um, Africa. Um, in India, I, I rode elephants. Um, in Africa, I was just amazed by, by their, their presence. Um, to get you oriented, um, this is Africa. It represents some 57 countries, about a billion people. And um, this is East Africa here, which is um, Kenya and Tanzania are the two um, larger um, countries. Uganda, Rwanda, and uh, Burundi uh, make up what is called East Africa. These three have been partners in, in commercial efforts, and uh, that's now coming back together. So Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania are coming together. This is Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, here is South Africa, which gets uh, a lot of attention uh, in the news as well. Uh, focusing on this a little bit more, um, the sisters taught me that um, the way they teach the students what Kenya looks like, it's uh, like it's a, a woman's girdle. And uh, to keep them oriented, this is the woman's girdle here. This is Nairobi, uh, Eldenet, uh, a couple of key cities. Here's the Indian Ocean. Uh, India is up here. And um, this is a, a beautiful ocean, um, which uh, can be quite warm and, and lovely and clean if you're there at the right time of year. Um, I put a number of arrows up here because I'm going to be talking about these places so you get some orientation to, to where, uh, where I'm uh, referring to. Uh, we landed in Nairobi, and that's where the University of Nairobi is. And um, how that happened, uh, Dr. June Brady referred me to uh, Agre Wasuna, who is a professor of pediatrics and chair of pediatrics at the University of Nairobi. Uh, so I had a number of correspondence with him, more going out than coming back. But basically, we got to the point that uh, uh, that we had an understanding. Um, I arrived and I had a letter from the chancellor saying that I was approved under Stanford funding uh, as a visiting professor. Uh, that's always a good way to go into a place. Uh, you don't cost them anything and uh, that gives you uh, a more open door. Uh, other places that we went to, uh, Naivasha is where Father Karidi's operation is. Nukuru is a place where he has um, a, um, a place, uh, a program for uh, street children that they, that they rescue from the streets and give a home and a school. Uh, there are two um, medical schools in Nairobi, uh, in uh, Kenya, one in Nairobi, which is the uh, first one, and the second in Moy, which is in Eldoret. And those of you who are distance runner, runners know that maybe some of the great runners have come from Eldoret, and that, that, that of course, is true. Um, they have two uh, mountains that get people's attention, particularly those that like to trek the mountains. Uh, this one is about 18,000, Kilimanjaro, and Kenya uh, is uh, not, uh, not a, a short mountain either. And this one's in Kenya and one's in, in Tanzania. They're right next to each other. So my travels went between these two countries, but I spent uh, three quarters of my time here and a quarter of the time in uh, Tanzania. I did stop by Karatu, and I'll be talking about Karatu because um, we have a, um, a fellow colleague from Modesto who's setting up a hospital and, and uh, dispensary there as I, as I speak. And Arusha is the main town in uh, Tanzania. Uh, which is uh, a busy city, but not, not the capital. So that's, we're going to be going around this area somewhat. Um, some demographics about, uh, about Kenya. About 37 million people. When you begin to check any number, so those of you who are officiados about Africa, you may have your own numbers, and my numbers are not exactly yours. Um, I did get mine from a source, but they vary a little bit. And I think as we speak, uh, the population is growing, so they're probably changing as we speak anyway. Um, about 37 mi million people. Uh, a real hefty birth weight, um, a birth weight, birth rate, about uh, one and a half million. Uh, the weight is actually low. The rate, uh, birth rate is high. Infant mortality, uh, 57.4 per thousand. To put it in perspective, uh, this is for children under five. Ours is five per thousand. Uh, but we're number 17. So they're much further down the, down the ladder. Uh, HIV, they've done pretty well. Uh, it's now down about 6%, but still represents um, uh, 1.3 million people, so a significant public health impact. And they estimate uh, a million or more children uh, who are homeless because of, of, of AIDS, uh, losing both parents. And that's one of the missions that Father Caridi has. He provides a home uh, and in part for children who are, who are uh, orphans because of uh, parents who have AIDS. Uh, they have a lot of children. Uh, some things I read said 60% are children. Uh, others say 50%. 50%. 
Uh, they consider you an adult when you're 14, um, and that has to do with uh, tribal ideas and so forth. Um, life expectancy is actually dropping in Kenya. It used to be 62, 65, now it's dropped to 52. Uh, the capital is Nairobi, very interesting place, has about three million people and growing, and um, it has one of the largest slums in the world, and that's also growing. Um, had an opportunity to go there, which I didn't take the time to do it, which I regret, but hopefully I'll go back and, and spend time there. But you always have considerations. I know I can get in, but I can, can I get out? And, uh, but now I'm pretty sure I can get out, so I'll, next time I'll, I'll try that. Um, how big is it? It's about the size of Texas. Um, the language is, is primarily Kiswahili. Uh, so if we were starting the conference there, uh, Jambosana, and you'd yell back to me, Jambosana, and we'd get on with the proceedings. I say, Habari, how are you? And you say, Missouri, and, and the show goes on. Um, the religion, um, a lot of Christian religions there, about 80%, and then 10% uh, Muslim, particularly along the coast. And a place like Lamu, which I should have pointed out on a map uh, earlier, uh, which is on the coast of uh, Africa with uh, Mombasa. Um, and um, also indigenous beliefs, particularly with people like the Maasai, who have animal gods and mountain gods and things of that sort. Um, I'm reminded to tell you, I just came from a research conference um, in, in Boston, and there was a presentation from a Nigerian researcher. And um, he was explaining the difficulty of understanding uh, various um, ethnic differences. And he was actually doing a study in his own country and um, they were trying to describe circumcision. There's religious circumcision, and then there was a practical cir circumcision that they were looking at uh, as an um, intervention to reduce the incidence of HIV. And uh, the people didn't understand him, and he said, you know, it's just very, very difficult. There are 70 tribes uh, plus in, in um, Kenya, and um, some of the beliefs are secret, and they're by word of mouth, and it's kind of hard to know exactly what you're getting into if you're going to be doing research. And I haven't done research there yet, but uh, one of the, I had two motivations for, uh, for this sabbatical. One uh, was um, to try to begin to understand and to learn the relationship between accommodations, like ourselves, and the community practice or delivery of health care to the community. And the second, uh, the Academy of Pediatrics uh, section on perinatal pediatrics, were grappling with the concept of trying to develop a mentorship scholarship program which is international for developing countries like Africa, to work with the um, junior faculty and, acad and academic centers um, under a research model uh, to look at particular problems that could be focused on, have them come to an American university, um, fine tool the, the, the project, add partic particular uh, ancillaries that could make the project more robust, more robust than they could do in their own country, and then send them off to do the project, work with them with the presentation, publication, and, and so forth. So there isn't this come come and gone kind of uh, aspect which uh, currently is happening. Uh, literacy is fairly high primarily because of uh, the Christian schools. Um, they represent about 80 to 90 percent of the um, educational system for the primary and secondary level. Uh, Father Creedy having a secondary school, high school level is, is really an accomplishment. Um, people uh, have so little it's kind of hard for me to understand how they could even survive. Uh, so $200 a day um, would be very poor, and some people don't even have that. $700 would be a minimum wage, and it averages out to about $1,500 a year. Uh, the currency is uh, a shilling, uh, 64 shillings per, per dollar. Um, to give you an idea how the country is doing, uh, this is from The Economist. Um, they had uh, 300,000 telephone lines, landlines. 30% uh, worked um, some of the time, except that it was a different 30%. So, what that meant, basically, was that no one had really phone service. Now, uh, commercial entities have come in, uh, one through England, and one primarily with people in, in Kenya, and they have nine million uh, mobile phones, which has made a tremendous difference in terms of communication. If you want to read about the, uh, the, uh, the voice of uh, revolution, uh, you could certainly read, uh, uh, read uh, Nigugi Wa Tiangyo, who uh, is now a professor of international studies and writing at the uh, University of California, Irvine. Um, he wrote uh, an important book, uh, which was called uh, um, Petals of Blood. Uh, the country didn't like that very much, so they threw him in jail. Uh, he got out of jail, and now he's in, in the United <laughs> States. He's been at Yale and other universities. Um, it's, a, it's sort of a difficult read. It's allegorical, but uh, very interesting. And having been there, it, uh, it really awoken a number of of things that I was already experiencing. 
Um, this is Kilimanjaro, um, nearly 18,000 feet tall. And uh, basically, this is what you get if you wake up early in the morning and you're lucky that there isn't mist and you can take a picture. And this is one of about 50 pictures um, I took uh, of Kilimanjaro. Um, I took about 4,000 images while I was there. Um, there was a, a Nikon DS70 and uh, primarily using an 8200 Nikkor zoom or a 3550 uh, for, for close, closer work. Um, I did not. Um, I did not abuse the privilege of being a doctor. Uh, I, I did not take pictures of people in compromised uh, situations, particularly in a, in a hospital. So I basically, when I went there, I went there with my eyes and my, and my, uh, my presence, but uh, not necessarily with my camera. Uh, I already mentioned this. There are two medical schools. Um, the Nairobi Medical School started in 68. Uh, the country became a republic in 63. I should have pointed that out on the earlier slide, but some of you hopefully caught that. And then Eldoret uh, started more recently in 84, the medical school in 1990. Uh, and that's just northwest of, um, of Nairobi. And the first graduating class was in 1997. Um, if you uh, come to the entryway of Kenyatta Hospital, which is the university hospital for Nairobi, uh, this is what it looks like. Um, a lot of people gathered about. Um, they are proud that the hospital is in the shape of an age, but no, they do not have a helipad. Uh, this is some African art here, which is um, a mother and, and some kind of a steel, steel struc structure. Um, the interior courtyards uh, have a lot of place for people to gather. And uh, for pe pediatricians, I can tell you that when you're in the pediatric setting, which is about 200 beds of this 1,000-bed uh, hospital, uh, you can find um, many mothers and family with their children. They're, they're needed because they, the crew come through with a 15-gallon bucket of, um, of gruel and other, other things, and someone has to stand up for their child and make sure that they get, get a portion. The mothers are there to breastfeed and, and so forth. So they're very, very part of the operation. Nursing staff is uh, in short supply. Um, typical pediatric ward situation is one nurse for 14 patients. And the residents have to learn that when you write an order, it doesn't mean that it'll get done. So typical rounds the following day, uh, the residents have, well, I ordered it, and the faculty will say, you're responsible for making sure that the patient gets the blood test done, the transfusion done, the IV, and so forth, which means that you start the IV, you mix the solution, you do the whole nine yards, otherwise the patient's not gonna get it. Their difficulty is, there are more numbers than they have time, and so they have to prioritize their work to decide who is gonna get what that day. This is the urgent care center. I took this at the end of the day. Uh, there is a whole line that goes forever uh, as people go into this ER. And the typical things of respiratory and gastrointestinal and other, other problems. Um, I was impressed uh, that their screening for dehydration would be uh, we try oral solution first if the baby can take it. And if they're satisfied that the child can take enough oral hydration, they're good with that. If the child cannot, they will not gavage and send them out. They will not give IV and send them out. They keep them there. On the other hand, I've been in hospitals out in the middle of nowhere uh, in the wildlife areas in which a dispensary would take a, a poor Maasai who collapsed um, out, out in, the, uh, in a distance somewhere, bring them in, give them IVs, get them pepped up, and set them out the door uh, to go on about their business. Um, this is what the Department of Pediatrics uh, looks like. Um, one of the things you become aware of, things are well guarded and locked and secure and so forth. Um, this, is a, um, this is a poor place, and it's, it's a place where, where things have legs or can have legs very, very simply by just being left around. Uh, something to keep in mind for those of you who bring in equipment to various places that may be there while you're there looking at it and maybe not, not there later. Uh, I'm still talking about government hospitals. Uh, there is a whole uh, another area which is called NGO, which is true for India and true for, uh, for Africa, the non-government organizations. One of the ways that people fight their professional frustrations is that they set up their own operation. If they're independently wealthy, or if their friends are, uh, they build their own place and they do it their way. And they don't answer to anyone. And they do have a door that's open and a door that's closed. Government hospitals, um, uh, they don't have uh, JCO. Uh, the door is always open. So a typical day at Kenyatta, there would be um, half dozen, dozen children uh, dropped off with gastrointestinal problems. Uh, there's a ward for Kwashiorkor and Merasmus. And there are also another dozen children who are dropped off because their parents can't take care of them. They're just dropped at, at the door. So I think that there are a lot of things going on. A lot of children waiting for surgery. 
there are no pediatric surgeons. Um, depending upon the complexity of the surgeon would determine uh, the willingness and eagerness of the adult surgeon to even take it on as a case. So you find some children in some gruesome situations because they're waiting for a service that, that may, uh, may not be forthcoming. This is another government uh, hospital. Um, it was donated by uh, King uh, Fahad and Lamu. And um, yet, um, it basically is 400 bed hospital, both pediatric and, and children. I got here by a water taxi, which is kind of fun. And um, the way I would um, operate as I went around the country, um, I knew where the hospitals were, knock on the door, ask to see the hospital administrator, and um, meet with him or her, usually him. And uh, we would find out about what the hospital was doing. He found out what I was doing and basically um, made arrangements to go on rounds, be, get a tour of the hospital. And this place, I came back a second time, we went, went on rounds, he said, we know nothing about pediatrics. Uh, you're welcome here. And he said, listen to this guy because he'll really tell you about pediatrics because what I've been telling you is probably not correct. But he actually did a fairly good job. Uh, most of these people are trained at the University of Nairobi. So I, I think they're not, they're not far from home. How much do things cost? Um, I'd like you just to focus on the obstetrical. This, these are interpartum services. Um, there's a, a copay at all places. So when I was doing mobile clinics, uh, there's copay there too. And, and the women are coming up with these little, uh, little purses of coins and putting out a few coins for things. And avocado you can get for four shillings. Um, you can probably get antibiotics for about five shillings. Uh, but you have to come up with something. And there were times uh, with a mother crying, a uh, sister would just bend. Uh, we had to pay for the medications in an outrage uh, kind of a situation, but she would just bend because you've got a sick child, a crying mother, what are you going to do? You're going to give her the medications. But um, in these instances, uh, people do get care, but if you add up all of these, the per day cost, the PCOTOMY, and special drugs and so forth, it comes to about $13 to $15 a day. Um, why, why don't they just do it for free? Uh, because they can't. They have to operate this building, pay the, pay the people who are there. Uh, they had about three uh, three doctors uh, for these 400 patients. So they're rather slim in what they have to offer. They're trying to retain nurses. If they're lucky, they have laboratory personnel. If they're even luckier still, they have actually laboratory tests that they can do. Uh, they do have some things that are nationalized, uh, malaria treatment, Ar artemisian, which is an old Chinese uh, therapy uh, mixed with quinine is being used for children and for, for adults. Uh, they do cerebral, see cerebral malaria, which is sad and they see uh, a whole range of problems, a lot of them infectious and, and others, which I'll get into a little bit later in the talk. Um, but I think that um, the costs seem low, but if you're, if you're earning a, a dollar a day uh, and it costs you $13 for a delivery, uh, it may explain why uh, most of the people don't deliver in the hospital. Um, now this is, um, this is a, how should I put, a independent, um, organization uh, called uh, Foundation for African Medicine and Education um, run by uh, Frank Artress, who basically um, spent most of his professional career at Modesto at Doctors Hospital as a cardiovascular um, surgery anesthesiologist. And he happened to operate on a, on a man who had um, a coronary bypass and this guy said to him, if, um, if I survive this, I will bring you to Africa. And um, the, the man actually is a, uh, a German who his family grew up in Africa and Tanzania. And the family um, um, has a complicated story because they, they have a home that predated the wildlife areas becoming, becoming nationalized. And so their home is right in the middle of the Arusha Wildlife National Park. And, um, but at any rate, he was a good guy to be connected with. And Frank Atres went, uh, got all excited about doing something in Africa. And he has an academic model, interestingly enough, because he's building a compound on, on, um, on a plot that has uh, about 30 acres. Um, big problems he's having right now is that the elephants keep on trampling onto his ground. So he has people operating uh, elephant whips and noisemakers and so on. So you have that excitement when you go onto the property. And he had the grandiose idea of building a hospital that was going to be 100 bed. And now he's down to a 15 bed dispensary which is how most of these NGOs start. They start small and then they work their way up with more, more beds as they go along. The churches have all done this. Uh, private people have done it. Um, this is a guy who's doing it on his own. It's based uh, on a trust and raising money to do this. But it's an academic model in that he has a compound which will have housing for people to visit, residents, nurses, 
uh, doctors who have new technology to present, uh, places for people to study to try to understand the problems. Um, it, it's really an exciting project which um, should be finished sometime early in 08. Now back to the government hospitals. This is Naivasha, uh, Naivasha Dist District Hospital. This is about um, a 600 bed operation and it's just across the street from Father, Father Caridi's uh, three acre program. And, um, and right next to this is a huge slum, which I'll show you a picture of in, in a minute. Um, all across Africa, uh, and also in India, you see this VCT. This is Voluntary Counseling and Treatment Center. The, um, the treatment, the screening is out in the periphery, but the uh, treatment and management is primarily centralized. So people go to these VCT clinics. So if we saw someone in the community, um, we would do um, basically uh, field testing, uh, which would be a two-step test. I don't know how good it was, so I don't know the specificity, sensitivity, and so forth, but if that was positive, then they went into one of these centers and had further testing to confirm, confirm their diagnosis and they were set up for treatment. At least in Kenya and Tanzania, uh, the medications, the antiretroviral medications are available to people. Um, I, I struggle with the word using free because nothing is free. I mean, someone is paying for it. Uh, Merck, I think, may be one of the people paying for it. But basically, they do have uh, medications available uh, to them. Um, just wanted to get you an idea what it looks like down Main Street, going into a shop. Um, not much refrigeration around. Uh, eggs are not refrigerated. So I spent a long time just peering at the eggs. Do I want to risk eating an egg? And then finally, I took the jump and ate several eggs. So I got through it and I'm OK, but I'm sure there was some risk. The eggs are not refrigerated. Um, Marcy and cleaning up a kitchen uh, in a place where we were staying in sort of like a college compound, uh, there was a chicken in a drawer. That chicken had been there for I don't know how long. That chicken found its, found its way out of the drawer and not on the table but because we were doing the cooking at that time. But, um, so this is the sense of refrigeration. Celtel is a company that I, I chose. Um, if you go there, I would recommend Safaricom. It's a better, better outfit. Uh, there's a story behind that which I can't go into now. Uh, you can get your batteries charged, your, your phones charged. Um, there's mobile charge. So you wonder, you know, I'm going to tell you that most of the people don't have electricity. But 9 million people have mobile phones. What do they do? They go to one of these places, have it charged up, put it back in their pocket, and they go. My problem was um, I was trying to buy uh, phone cards that cost, I wanted to buy 1,000 shillings because I'm calling my kids at home. And it costs a fair amount of money to do that, several dollars. And um, they're selling 20 shilling, 40 shilling. And I said, well, you know, I don't want to buy, I don't want to buy 50 20 shilling cars because you have to enter each one into your phone and use a code and, and so on. So there were places I could find 1,000. But this is a, a major place of operation. Uh, you'd be surprised. I, I was disappointed that I didn't see any Packard Children's uh, Hospital shirts. I wish that I had brought some, but I saw Texas Children's. There's a, there are a lot of American clothes. Um, on kids and adults uh, as you go around the community. And uh, so there are people there from Harvard and from various uh, universities. Um, Stanford is underrepresented. Next time I go, we brought backpacks this time. I'm going to bring Stanford shirts, Packer shirts, so we can pass them around town. Um, this is what it looks like uh, in many places. This is just one picture. I had the camera at my hip and I uh, took a few of these pictures. Uh, but basically, there is no electricity. There are no streets. There are no street signs. Uh, I was taken here by Jacinta, who is a social worker for Father Caridi. And how she knew her, her way around uh, became clear to me because she didn't know her way around all these streets either. She would see people she know, and she would say, Samuel, how do I get to wherever? And we'd get redirected and where we were going. People stop us in the street. The kids are, are beautiful. They don't, they don't know that there's another world out there. And they basically uh, have survived uh, age five. They don't celebrate survival age five like they do in India. If you uh, survived age five, that's a celebration of life. Most uh, Africans that I came in contact with in a clinic setting, they have no idea when they were born. They don't know what their birthday is, obviously. And they don't know how old they are. And uh, since I'm a doctor who does physical examinations, I was using a bathroom scale. I was using a weighted scale for babies. Um, lift up the baby, see what the age was that they gave me. If it didn't mix with what I, I thought I was seeing developmentally, uh, I puzzled it and figured out, tried to figure out what the baby's age was. So just very simple things that we take for granted. LGA, SGA, give me a break. 
Uh, in, the, in, in the hospital, everybody was more or less SGA. So I gave up. I'd go on rounds and I tried to be uh, professorial and say, it looks like a 30-week gestation baby. They said, no, that's full term. <laughs> so anyhow, humbling. Um, this is Father Creedy since I've been talking, to him, uh, talking about him. Uh, he's a Kabuki uh, tribe uh, person. And uh, right now, the Kabukis are in charge of Kenya uh, with Kabaki, who is the, um, um, the president and probably will be reelected. He's a university guy with uh, orientation towards economics. Uh, but I think he could probably do even more with economics in Kenya. And um, that those are ongoing issues. Uh, people find reasons to, to dance. Here he is dancing with his, his people at the opening of the girls' school, which was just such a wonderful, wonderful event. Um, this is the one vignette I'm going to give you to show you what a clinic looks like. So um, going to clinic with the sisters, you wake up early in the morning, and you drive half a day, and you're there. And the people come out of the wilderness from nowhere. And they gather around. They begin to sit around waiting for you to get set up. I was proud of the fact that we had uh, privacy curtains and the like a generator, bring all of our, our stuff in. We had a nurse, a nurse assistant. In our case, they had me, the doctor. Uh, we had an administrator and a lab tech generator. We brought in our own water because the places don't have water. Um, they would have a long drop, but no electricity. Um, and um, at the beginning of the, of the clinic, you could see reasonably well. But the light was blinding you as it was coming through the window that you were parked in front of trying to see patients. And as you got to afternoon, it was getting more difficult to see. Your eyes weren't blurring uh, because of, the, uh, uh, because of the, the sunlight coming through. But now you're having trouble seeing. And by the end of the day, I was using my flashlight trying, trying to see the patient and figure out, figure out what, was, what was going on. Um, when we would go to clinics, we would bring, uh, this is food, uh, grains. Um, the major, uh, every day you can have maize. Uh, it's called ugali. And uh, that's what I have here. I have it misspelled. It's actually U-G-A-L-A. Ugali, and the ugali um, is cooked up in a cauldron. Uh, in this case, uh, in the back of this church, they were cooking it up, uh, boiling it. And um, in the morning, we had what uh, it had a little brown to it, but it wasn't chocolate. It was porridge, and it has a tendency to hard into sort of like a briquette. Uh, no, you don't put any butter on it. There's no maple syrup. You just eat it as it is. It's very bland. They love it. Uh, a meal without ugali is not a meal at all. And the other thing is kale. Uh, kale is like chard, and you'll find the women in the street uh, shaving the chard, so it comes very thin. Um, if you don't have anything to put with it, you just have chard. If you're lucky, you might put some amend amendments with it, some vegetables and things of that sort. Um, so these are the three sisters who are, are facing the other direction. This is a, a assistant. Uh, this is Judith and Elizabeth, and she's not wearing a Stanford hat either. I need to bring some hats. Uh, this church, uh, what I found interesting, it has no electricity, but on one of the rafters up high, and I didn't get a, a shot of this picture, it says, during service, turn off mobile phone. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of, kind of interesting. And I, I left out of the picture, there's a, car, a, a cow parked out here, a cow, and there is, um, here's some maize over here and some other, other, um, um, other fields of, um, of grain. Uh, this is what uh, orphanage look, looks like. Uh, there's a whole mix of children in here. Um, uh, they look pretty OK um, uh, until you get really close to them. I was sort of the orphanage doctor when I was there. So I was asked to come and see a child with a fever and so on. It was very educational to me because I was there. Uh, my tools were a stethoscope, a uh, flashlight, um, and myself. And to refer the child someplace, uh, either to take him across the street or to have, have them seen in one of our outreach, outreach clinics. Uh, there's a child here with uh, a type 2 truncus, which I'm for, unfortunately she has uh, pulmonary hypertension. Uh, so they asked me to see her, but there wasn't a whole lot to be seen, uh, a whole lot that could be done. She already been seen at the University of Nairobi and different places, and, and uh, that is sort of a sad case. The youngest child is here is Marcy, and, and here's my wife, uh, Marcy, in, 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 the, in the back, and she's wearing uh, her African dress. Uh, we had talked about the ideas, me wearing my African dress today, but we decided that you're too conservative, so I didn't wear it. <laughs> um, this is the street school in Dukuru. Dukuru is one of the big, big towns in, in uh, Kenya. Uh, big towns are um, Nairobi, uh, Mombasa, and Nakuru. 
And the Karoo has uh, children just wandering around the street uh, because they've lost their parents and things like that. And they're gathered together in the school, pretty bare walls. Um, they were having class. I walked in. The one thing I saw on the wall was personal hygiene, that they were learning English. And I asked, does anybody know what that was? Of course, they all giggled. So I, I had them, you know, bring me water. And every place I traveled, uh, here's my plastic bag with a bar of soap. And I always joked that um, to bring American soap to Africa was really something. All I needed was water. I brought my own water and asked for water where I went. But, uh, but basically, I was just trying to teach them a little germ, germ theory and hoping that it would spread to their entire body. However, I think that uh, it's a difficult situation when you don't have running water. Uh, the Maasai get a lot of attention. So when you open up your National Geographic, when you go on to one of the history channels and so forth, this is sort of what you see. Um, this tribe came from Sudan um, about 1,000 years ago. And they um, emigrated to uh, Kenya and to Tanzania. Tanzania. Um, they're a very colorful group. Uh, they wear the shuka, which is this uh, colorful robes that they wear around them. Uh, you can find them in the middle of nowhere. Uh, they feel that they're in charge of the wilderness. Uh, their main occupation is grazing animals, and they're uh, somewhat nomadic. Uh, these are some of their women and their, their children. Um, and visiting this village, uh, all the kids had a running nose. Uh, and uh, they were, were dressed in a typical dress. Um, this is a house back here, which is a, a, which is a dung thatched house. Um, the women in the crowd won't like this, but uh, the women are in charge of building the house and maintaining the house. Uh, unfortunately, they're also in charge of getting the water, getting the fuel, and getting the food. Uh, although the men are armed with a spear, a dagger, and a shield, and um, if they become a Moran, uh, they are now uh, tribally adults, uh, which means that they've killed a lion, which now happens in a group because there aren't so many lions, so people don't want the, the lions killed off, so they have a group get together and they all take credit, sort of like we do with collaborative research. <laughs> they all get together. <laughs> Uh, they get credit for, for get, getting the uh, animal. But um, a tremendous burden on the, on the women uh, in these places. Um, this is the kitchen. And you can see a source of some problems for children. Uh, the fire is close to the ground with a, with a boiling pot. And uh, so I saw uh, many children with various kinds of uh, pretty severe burns uh, with water uh, dumping on them. Uh, when I went to the uh, slum in Naivasha, um, one of the things that we knew, um, Marcy had met uh, the mother of this house. They had five children. And um, there were three kids that they thought had uh, malaria, and they were sick with fever and, and some, kind of a, some kind of an illness. So I went in to see them. Uh, the father was there with the three kids. Uh, the three children were 18, uh, 3, and 5. And um, the 18-month-old uh, was uh, on the ground, crawling around uh, with this kind of an arrangement, which made me a little bit nervous. Uh, but after all, it's a one-room house, two beds in it. I came to arm with uh, two fancy mosquito nets. And uh, Jacinta was with me. I looked at this guy and I said, I brought you mosquito nets. And the guy's looking at me, you're kidding, right? But his, his wife is out trying to find food. Uh, they don't have any water. And uh, I bring him mosquito nets. I mean, how do you eat a mosquito net? But I also brought some fruit. So I brought a little bit of food along, along the way, too. And the next thing is, uh, mosquito nets are, are hung from a hook, right? Just hang it from a hook over your, over your king-size bed. Um, you had no hook. Uh, on the top of this, uh, this place, which was, uh, oh, maybe 10 by 12, 10 by 15 in size, uh, he had a shelf with a bunch of belongings on it, clothes and other things, and then two beds, one for he and his wife and one for everybody else. And then a little pathway down, down the middle, a lot of mud, and this kind of a kitchen off to one, one side, and a door that's kind of open, and maybe a couple lines out front where you could hang things after you wash them. Um, I saw the kids. Uh, we, we, we did uh, grovel in the mud a little bit together, and uh, I didn't think that they had malaria. Um, they did have a viral illness, uh, which brings up another, another issue. I was probably uh, good and bad in the outpatient setting because um, like I remember Chicago in the 60s, uh, everybody expected to get something when they saw the doctor. And that something was often a shot. And we gave a lot of injections, penicillin, gentamicin, whatever we had available to people. And um, when I would see a child that I thought had a viral illness, and if I thought it wasn't lower respiratory, um, 
they wouldn't get injected because I worried about giving them antibiotics and, and what next would happen to them with a, with a viral illness. Maybe setting them up for a MRSA or something else that would be, would be worse. Uh, so I did leave this family with their, their two mosquito nets. I put up one and I left this poor guy who's probably still trying to figure out how to put up the second one. And I did sort of jerry-rig it onto the, onto the shelf with all their human possessions and I said, you know, this is for the children and so forth. These are the women. Um, part of their adulthood uh, is that they get shaved from head to toe, which uh, for them is, um, is um, a beauty as an adult woman, and I think it is beautiful. Uh, they wear this uh, very colored of uh, necklace dressing and these long robes, um, and um, they're, they're very, uh, very much in a tribal scene. But things are changing, this 5% of the population. And uh, these are, are some uh, Maasai men uh, with their, their spear and their dagger trying to get money out of an ATM and, um, and this is in Lamu. Uh, they're everywhere. I mean, I'm, I'm always amazed that we're out in the middle of a wildlife park and we find um, a young boy, 13, 14 years old, few cow, few steer, sheep, and a few goats um, with lions roaming around and so forth taking care of their, taking care of their flock. But um, the tale is told that um, don't mess with the Maasai and the lions uh, need to respect that. Um, Part of becoming a man, and I'm, I'm not showing you my picture because I didn't do very well, uh, they have jumping contests. And the women are impressed the most with the men who can jump the highest. <laughs> and uh, here they are showing, showing their jumping. And if they're really well shooed, uh, and you can't really see these too well because I didn't get a close up, get me a piece of leather, a part of a worn tire, strap that together, put it on my foot, I can go anywhere. Uh, this is a Maasai herd. Uh, they have Indian Brahmas. Uh, they're very proud of. They have auctions where they auction off the meat. And they have to go from Graceland to Graceland. Uh, any family would have as many as five or six houses where they would go from place to place just to take care of their, their, their flock. Here's one of my teachers, David Reed. He's 85 years old. Um, those of you who would like to know more about the Maasai, I highly recommend reading him. Um, Barefoot over the Serengeti talks about his life as a child. Um, he, um, his family came from Britain. Uh, he was born in um, Nairobi and basically uh, spent most of his, his childhood, up to 14 years, uh, living with the Maasai. So he had run, run around with them uh, and learned uh, much of his early uh, thinking uh, from the Maasai and later on in his life uh, uh, writes about it. He's 85 years old. He lives right next to a wildlife park. Um, he has a dog that is uh, daily, uh, daily fighting off uh, the elephants that come in and, uh, and the warthogs who uh, the, the dog has learned how to get along with the warthogs without getting injured. Is Africa dangerous? You know, when you begin to realize, um, just imagine that downtown Palo Alto is a wildlife park and um, there's really no electric fence around it. And basically, you go down there, and uh, you need to know who are the predators and who are the safe animals. And uh, if there are, are a few baboons around, they're an annoyance. But you know the animals that you don't have to worry about, you don't need to worry about. And you need to keep an eye on the zebras and the rest, because when the zebras are, are running off, you ought to take, take note uh, yourself and, and not, not stick around. Uh, this is a very deadly snake. Uh, but you know, it's a young snake. The young snakes are green, uh, these uh, mambas. And as they uh, become adults, uh, they become black. Uh, this snake was from here to, to there, except that I had a window here. And so I could very conveniently take my picture uh, as the truck was moving by. Um, camping, uh, you camp with the elephants. Um, I wouldn't be here giving this talk, except that we um, decided to get a honey pot for our tent so that uh, if I needed to relieve myself in the middle of the night, um, I didn't walk out uh, as I did on some earlier camping trips out into the wilderness and take risk of uh, not being able to come back into the tent. Okay, now turning into um, UNESCO data, and I certainly have been too talkative so far, but I think you can get the point from this uh, in, a, in a few minutes. Uh, these are the 10 countries in, in the orange uh, that represent a uh, majority of, of deaths, 10 million deaths that are occurring in children under five uh, in the undeveloped world. Um, they, um, are 10 million, 28,000 deaths per year. And um, what, did they, what did they find? Um, the ways that they thought that they could save lives would be skilled 
skilled care of childbirth. Uh, as I was trying, trying to allude to, uh, the people in, in Kenya um, um, are, are too, how should, too often just uh, delivering without, without any uh, skilled assistance. Breastfeeding for at least six months. I thought it was going to be great in Kenya because every woman that I saw, it looked like she was uh, nursing her child. But actually, when they look at the scorecard, um, many of them are not really nursing more than, more than a couple of months, pro probably because of their own nutrition. They have measles immunization here, but immunization in general uh, is something that uh, is trying to be addressed in the clinics that we were working in. Oral rehydration therapy for, for uh, diarrhea, which is safe, not using local water. And medical care for pneumonia, uh, usually treating it acutely be before the children die. So who are the, who are the individuals who are having problems? This is why neonatology has a, has a good, uh, good role there. Newborn disorders, pneumonia, diarrhea account for 73% of the deaths among children under five. And so if you look at the pie diagram, uh, you can get an idea of what, what's going on. Prematurity is 28%, and most of the children I saw were late preterms that they could actually manage to take care of, but they had limited resources to take care of them, and it's not, um, it's not difficult uh, to see a child who has cornicterus and a child with conditions that you would like to, like to prevent. But you can see the conditions um, uh, from the newborn and other conditions that are in the bar graph there. Um, and these are conditions that um, UNESCO feels can be, can be addressed. So their idea is that if uh, you can address the newborn causes, the measles, uh, HIV, and you see the HIV represents less than 10% of the deaths of children under, under uh, five. And as important as that problem is as a public health issue, uh, there are so many other problems that unfortunately uh, get left behind uh, as that one is trying to be solved. Malaria is a big problem, and you see pneumonia as part of the uh, part of the risk. Now, if you look at um, populations from the poorest to the wealthiest, um, poorest here, wealthiest there, and you look at different countries, um, and this is uh, Malawi. Malawi is uh, being talked about because uh, they've had very good scores with very limited resources uh, because they've been able to use the money to accomplish the objectives. And what is waiting to be seen is when the nurses and doctors leave Malawi, whether or not it will have carry through by the population alone. But right now, they've, they've had tremendous impact on their, their health issues. But this just shows you that um, the, um, the, the, percent of, uh, uh, the percent of children receiving uh, care uh, is, to no one's surprise, better uh, when, when they have resources to do so. And Malawi uh, basically has done pretty well. Even uh, their poor children are having better access to medical care for reasons that I just gave. Here are some other countries. Um, there isn't time to talk uh, at great length about, about India. It's talking about the under five mortality. And again, looking at the same issues, the poorest in yellow, uh, the richest in red. And you can see how that affects your mortality. Here's, here's India. Um, and here's Kenya. The difficulty when you're a big country uh, with a lot of children, uh, anything that happens that is bad, uh, the numbers are going to show this in really high, high numbers because of your large population. Um, this is to say that there's a relationship between those countries that have difficulty with the child deaths, here's six million, and also maternal deaths. They line up uh, along, the same, along the same table. Um, the effect of, um, of having a skilled help in the delivery room, um, if you have 100% uh, coverage, like in the United States, the number of deaths you have are few. But as you get to uh, countries, uh, Asia, Africa, uh, where you have um, many, many fewer uh, um, caregivers in the, um, in the birthing process, uh, you have a higher mortality rate. Now, the point I want to make here is if you add to poverty war, what happens? And um, uh, this is you know, three pages of tables, but I've chosen uh, India, which has actually done pretty well, and it's had uh, uh, improvement. Uh, also, uh, Tanzania and Uganda. Uh, Kenya, unfortunately, has not uh, quite done as well in terms of these under five mortalities. Per thousand, 95 has gone up to 120. And Iraq uh, has actually done much worse uh, because of uh, the ravages of war. Other things that could make a difference, nutrition, shelter, insecticide-treated mosquito nets, uh, improved mother's health and survival, access to safe water. Access is considered, if you're within five miles of water, that's access. But, uh, Again, it would be ladies, unfortunately. Uh, consider walking uh, five miles in the morning to get water for your cooking and for the care of your children during the day. Access to family planning is important. 
education for girls and women, uh, access to family planning, uh, HIV prevention and treatment. And uh, this is a malaria zone, so I'm going to go over this. Uh, this is the way women carry their, their children. Uh, they have these shawls, and they make um, a very nice uh, carriage. The kids, as they get older, are toddlers. The women bend over. The kids hang on to mama, and they wrap them around and tie them, and they, they stay secure uh, going about their, about their business. Um, when the women are educated, uh, this is Norway as an example. Uh, the uh, survival uh, or mortality is really very low. When the women are not so well educated, mortality uh, for infants is higher. Um, if you have family planning, the same thing. Um, uh, in countries where they have uh, family planning, um, see how this goes. Under five mortality, um, where there is no access to family planning, mortality is high. In other countries, here's Germany, where uh, they have access to family planning, uh, mortality is low. Uh, and again, there's a relationship between the two. Um, one of the points I want to make about the national papers in Kenya, they are, are really very open about saying whatever it is, is happening. happening. So one article would say 60% of the population is not getting adequate food in the paper as a headline. Or, or this one, safe motherhood is still a far cry for most women. Uh, it's true. Um, it's sort of a free press. Unfortunately, it doesn't have, it doesn't have the effect that you'd like it to have. Uh, this is the wildlife park in uh, Nairobi. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, the, the hill that was in out of Africa, uh, Nagog Hill. Uh, this is Nairobi over here. This is the African Heritage House. It's owned by an American, which is uh, not like any other house that you see all over Africa. He's been there for 40 years, involved in the arts and, and theater. Uh, what the plains look like, African buffalo, rhinoceros. Uh, this is a baby elephant that, um, unfortunately, I couldn't get under the elephant to show that she's actually breastfeeding. And, uh, and yes, like other, other mammals, the mother keeps walking, and the baby animal just needs to figure it out. And, uh, and they do figure it out. Um, this is a baobab tree and the elephant. Um, the reason why these are put together, um, this is what a hideaway looks for the poachers. This is what a baobab tree looks like after the elephants have uh, enjoyed the tasty bark. This is a wild beast, the warthog and amnesia. And what this is all about, um, the Africans love this animal. And they'll be the first to tell you is that uh, when you scare up a warthog, its tail goes up and it start, starts running about 20 feet, very fast, escaping. It forgets what it's escaping from, tail goes down, looks around, there's still a lion in there, tail goes up again, and it runs off. <laughs> Here's a leopard, uh, lionesses, uh, and this is with a 200 millimeter lens, uh, but I'm fairly close to them, but a, in, a, in a vehicle, cubs. This is Simba and a golden jackal, and there, there's really a choreographed uh, play. Uh, uh, it's the... Uh, the lion, the jackal, the hyena, uh, and then after that, the vultures, and then after that, the only thing that's left are, are the bones, the skeleton. Serval, which are difficult to see. Uh, Geronuk, which is the giraffe antelope, which is uh, the most angelic, interesting animal. And when you're, these are kids in the slum, and they're tagging at my, at my backpack, take my picture, take my picture. They're, they're just amazing. And you see what I mean about the American shirts. This little kid has on an American shirt. And they're wearing a uniform of the kids uh, going to one of the primary schools that's just across the street from the, from the slum. So what can we do, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, we need to find a way to really make a difference um, and have a world in which there's uh, understanding, unity, world of peace, uh, where men and women, nations, societies are, are ready to make a, a huge sacrifice to uh, communicate intelligent, intelligibly with each other, understand one another, cooperate with one, one another, and feeding the hungry millions and building a world of peace. And um, we can't do this with a ventilator. There are many more things that need to happen. Wahiri, goodbye. Thank you very much. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.